Good morning, everyone. We are very lucky today to have Lucia Piquero with us, doctora, although in English you cannot say the A at the end, but I say because uh, here is uh, for the whole world. We are very lucky to have Dr. Lucia Piquero. Uh, before and above everything else, she's an incredible human being, uh, super resilient, motivated, working, uh, capable, expert. If I would have to put someone on the other spectrum of mediocre, that would be on the other end, it would be Lucia Piquero. Uh, she's the head of the department of dance studies of the University of Malta. I had to rehearse that title three or four times before we started the call because I never know if it's the dance department, the, the department of studies of the Malta University in the, I don't know the order, but uh, hopefully it's that. Uh, and after that, she's, uh, after that, not hierarchies here, not levels, she's an amazing, uh, beautiful friend that I cherish. Uh, her company, the discussions that we have, how we collaborate and, and yeah, every time that I have a possibility to be in her presence or, or just plot something together, it is uh, a pleasure and something that I do not miss. Uh, she is with us today as the head of the Department of the Dance Studies of the University of Malta to tell us a little bit how it is from the other side when you start receiving uh, proposals, 10,000 millions of proposals a day, uh, what is, is useful for her, what is not useful for her. Uh, I mean, I don't really know the content, but that's a little bit the prompt. And uh, just to see how you can use it as towards Vivencia trainers in these moments of difficulties. Hopefully this session is gonna be very useful to see a little bit the other side of the people who are gonna be receiving your uh, proposals. So Lucia, thank you so much for agreeing to be with us uh, today and uh, giving us that other perspective. Thank you very much, Jorge, and I'll try my best to live up to that introduction <laughs> because I'm not <laughs> sure I'll manage. But um, so the plan we thought for today was that um, I'll start sort of talking a little bit about thoughts, you know, about how I received these emails, when, what do they look like, and then you know if there are any questions, just like let me know. Um, this is not obviously any sort of theoretically organized uh, presentation. It's more like giving you a feeling of the, uh, both the information I get, the information I need, and also, and I think this is important for you to know, the sort of feelings that come when I get all these emails as well, because it's, it's also quite a stressful situation, whether you believe it or not. Um, so the first thing that Jorge already pointed out is that we do get quite a lot of this. And, you know, I'm, we're quite a small department and I already get a lot of this. So if you're reaching out to sort of bigger, maybe more established departments, you can imagine how many of these emails they will get, yeah. Um, of course, and this is logical, I got quite a lot more emails than, than normal as soon as the pandemic started. And this is very, very normal. But it's, it was also the moment when I literally could not do anything. So also, I think the first point would be check your timing, see what the situation is in general. Um, in terms of timing, um, investigate a little bit the sort of working timing in the year of a university, of the university you're writing for or the organization you're writing to. Because I will tell you, like, if my exams are in February and you write to me in February, I will just not answer, probably, you know, I'll, I try my best to at least acknowledge, but you will get an acknowledgement that sounds something like, thank you for your proposal, we'll consider it and get back to you. And then it will be very difficult to actually get back to you in any time sort of reasonable. If you write in June, it's also a very bad idea because we're about to break for summer we're all exhausted at that point so you know it's very difficult to pay any proper attention and then if you're going to write when we've already started we're already set up for the year yeah so there are a few moments when it's a good idea to write so maybe think um i would say maybe like january december or depending yes we function in semesters which means we go from october to january and from February to June. All the universities function in terms, which means they would go from September to December, January to March or April, and then April to June. So these are the kind of things I tell you, just check the organization you're writing to. And usually the best thing is to write sort of 
beginning to mid of whatever it is, a term or a semester, not at the beginning, not at the very end, okay? So that's about timing. The second thing about timing is sometimes I get an email and they tell me, um, I would like to offer you this workshop next month. I can already tell you that's not gonna happen because it's just not possible, yeah? So the best thing you can do is offer something but give the opportunity to whoever is receiving this to set up the timing that makes sense for them. Of course, that is really difficult for you as well. I would understand that, you know, you need to organize your life, especially if you're a freelancer. And I mean, even if you work, there's, there's like timings that you need. You could offer sort of seasons, maybe, okay, these months work better for me this month. But if you just offer one and it's very close, it's just not possible. And it's nothing that we wouldn't want to do it. It's simply that organizing something like a workshop with a university takes a long time, yeah. So it's very difficult to organize something um, last minute. Um, I, I mean, the, the point that I think is very important as well is research as much as possible, the organization, the institution, try and find out what we do, um, if you can, how we work, you know, have a look, not just at the website of the institution, but also at the social media. That usually tells you a lot of more regular activities that doesn't, you know, they don't come up on the website usually. Um, but also remember that you, you are writing to someone that knows the organization better than you, obviously, because they're inside, yeah. So always sort of ask questions, you know, like see, what things interest you of the institution and why are you and basically what I want to know is why are you writing to us you know and not to someone else I think this is a bit basic but it's true as well if I see that is a blank email like a, a super like general email that you've sent to 100 million people I might not get as interested as if I see that you looked at us a little bit yeah and and made a little bit of a connection with what we're already doing. Um, the other thing I would recommend against, and this has happened to me about three times in the last two or three weeks, don't ask me for a meeting straight away. I'm sorry, I'm being a bit bland. So, okay, so I'm, I'm really sorry about this, but I think it's easier that I tell you like, I have so many meetings in a week that if I just get someone that I don't know at all, telling me, I would like to talk to you about a workshop with your students, can we meet? I would say no immediately. Because I just can't, you know, it's just not possible. If you tell me a little bit more about what you want to do, what sort of workshop, what shape, how long, you know, then maybe we can build up towards a meeting and actually have a nice discussion about things. And that would be perfectly fine. Again, this might be something that is more down to my character. I prefer to sort of set up some basics before I have a meeting with someone. But, you know, another person might not say that. I would recommend, though, give us information in the first, meet, in the first email so that we can make the decision whether we can take that meeting or not. Yeah, I tell you, I literally just got about two or three people writing to me saying, literally, um, I'm, I don't know, say, um, uh, dance teacher I want to offer you something to collaborate with your students can we have a meeting I don't have enough information to go with you know what I mean like there is just nothing there that it's just not enough for me to spend an hour or two talking to someone yeah and again it maybe in other circumstances it would be easier but as you know we're all going through a lot of different uh, organization of life right now and that means for us university lectures and admin staff a lot of extra meetings and, and a lot of time in front of the computer yeah so you're not going to want to do any more of that um okay the next thing that i would like to sort of bring up unless i mean i don't know if there's any questions already or should i finish through the main points and maybe we stop for questions shall we do that okay so um, the next thing would be, what are you offering? Yeah, and I mean, in, in this case, you probably have a very clear idea of what you're offering. But it would be important as well to sell it adequately. Yeah, in the sense that if you sell it to me, like this is the best thing that happened. 
I don't know, since uh, Forsyth changed the world of ballet, I might not believe you, you know what I mean? It might be true. I'm not saying it's not, but I might hesitate a little bit before believing what you're saying. So sort of like temple it a bit, yeah? See if you can tell me how, interest how interesting it is without selling it like the best thing that happens in like sliced bread. <laughs> when you write to us as well, try and see, do we have the expertise already in the department? So if you write to me and you offer me something I have, I will know two things. One, that I don't need to reply to you more than thank you for your, your offer, we are not interested at the moment. And two, that you haven't looked at us really. So try not to show that, yeah? Look at us, see what we do already, see what kind of people we have already. And if we have something that is very similar to you, we're probably not the best institution for you to offer what you have to offer. You, you can't, you know, you have a lot of other places that might very well be very interesting what you have to offer. But, you know, if we already have it, we're not gonna get someone external to do the same thing we do regularly, yeah? Um, but yeah, I think, I think the, the point is like, try to be um, honest with what you're saying and with the level of what you're offering. And remember that in this particular um, context, which might not apply to other contexts, but in this one, you're writing to someone that hopefully <laughs> is up to date with the developments in dance. So whatever you're going to say, I would have, one hopes it's not always true, but you know, generally speaking, I will have knowledge of what you're offering or at least the context of what you're offering. So you're not selling something to someone that doesn't know what you're talking about, yeah? So this is always good. Think that you're hopefully writing to a knowledgeable audience and, and write your information like that. All right, last point I want to make is, is a little bit about what to put on the email when you write. So the first thing is a little bit about you. So I. I will Google you, I'm not gonna lie to you, yeah? As soon as I get an email like this, uh, if it sounds like I'm interested in what you're offering, I will just do the good old Google and check who you are, where you trained. But if you do that job for me, it's even better, yeah? If you just put in there, and it doesn't have to be gigantic, it, it can be just a couple of sentences about your training, your interests, who you are, you know. Um, I would also, ask you to be clear. I mean, this is something silly, but if I have, if I struggle to understand what you're trying to tell me, it's not gonna help you, of course. So simple but clear, that's very good. Um, be precise as well, as much as possible. So don't, don't go into a whole sort of philosophical discussion with yourself in the email. Try and keep it clear. What, what are you wanting to do? What is it about? Who am I? And why should I be interested in what you have to do? Yeah. And I think this is very important. I also got a few emails. And just so that you know how I organize it, every time I get an email like this, it goes to a particular folder. There is this folder of proposals for collaboration. And every now and again, I go back and review and see if there's something there that we can do. Or maybe immediately it just caught my attention and we did something. But some of them, so this is how I prepared this session. Basically, I went back to that folder and I saw the emails I had received. Some of them just tell me I would like to work with you, but they don't specify what working with us would mean. Are you talking about classes? Are you talking about a workshop? Are you interested in being a choreographer for our third year tour? What exactly are you telling me that you want to do with our students, right? Who, who, like what students? Are you talking about undergraduate students, postgraduate students? Are you open to all levels? Um, how many students can you manage? I mean, right now, obviously we would decide that for you and uh, that will have to do with the safety measures at the school, but how many students would you like in your workshop? Or does it, it doesn't matter, you can go from one to 25 and it wouldn't be a problem. Um, how many hours do you need? How many days spread out? How are you coming to Malta or are you offering something online? Um, just like a, a little bit of like 
clarity as to what exactly you are asking. And then again, I know I'm asking you, this is very difficult, but be a bit flexible about it because I might have to tell you, I'm sorry, we can't offer so much, but we could, you know, offer you like one class here, or one class there or something. It happened very recently that I, I got about maybe two years ago, year and a half ago, time is funky right now, um, a, an offer for someone that had just moved to Malta and wanted to offer something to our students. And at the moment I couldn't offer anything, but they organized a workshop. So I went myself to the workshop and tested what they had done yeah so I saw what they had done I found it very interesting and now and a year and a half after I needed someone to come in from outside and I called these guys because I had the chance to meet them and I had the chance to see what they were doing and they didn't push it they just told me listen we're here if ever you need someone to cover a few classes so also I think don't don't be disheartened if we don't even immediately answer offering you everything you ask for it might be that just at the moment we can't and and it's not um, generally speaking it's not personal it's not that we didn't like the offer it's just that it doesn't work out I'm, I'm not sure how many of you have been in, in university context but if you have been you would know that things work slowly and very sort of like bureaucratically and you need to like follow a series of things so it won't be like I do this and I can organize a workshop, yeah. Um, and I think the last point I want to make before opening for your questions is that it also, it's, it's difficult for me to say no, I don't like it, yeah. I would like to offer opportunities to everyone, but it's, it's just not possible, yeah. It's literally sometimes it's just not possible. Um, and especially right now, you need to be very aware of all the things we have to deal with in the university side and i'm not saying we're suffering we're very privileged within this situation okay so i'm not going to say oh my god poor us no we have a job you know we have an, an institution that takes care of us so we are super privileged but at the same time we also have to go through certain hopes because of being part of an institution taking care of the students so right now anything that is being offered unless it's being offered online and very flexibly, I would have to say no immediately because it can't be. And on that note, I got an email, I think it was April probably. Um, it might have been a bit later, but anyway. And this, this uh, person was, it was quite nice. as someone that I've heard about before. So I replied and I said, listen, I'm really sorry, but right now, as you know, with the whole pandemic situation, I can't really promise anything and I can't really program anything. And, uh, you know, we can maybe talk about this for the year after, you know. And her reply was like, but I'm working with all these other universities. And I was like, hmm, maybe I won't call you after all, because you're not understanding what I'm telling you. You know, like I'm not saying I'm, I'm sure other universities work in different ways, but I'm telling you, I can't possibly program you at this point. And you're not understanding my point of view. And it wasn't the, gr the greatest reply. It doesn't really follow that I will not call this person ever. Huh? But, but it was a bit like, if I just told you I can't program you for the next year, but I'm sort of open for something in the next few years, there is no point for you to fight me. You know what I mean? It, if you tell me that you're working with 300 other institutions, it's really not going to change my mind because I still can't work with you on this one. Yeah. So... Um, I don't know really what the message of that is, apart from like giving you an example of someone that reacted a little bit, I'm, I'm not going to say aggressively, but perhaps not as uh, gentle as she could have for that particular um, circumstance. Yeah, so I think, I guess what I'm saying is be a bit patient with us, because <laughs> we also need to, uh, you know, work things out and, and make sure that we sort of offer you and offer our students the best possible circumstances for this to be a, a proper exchange and a, and a successful exchange. Um, I think that's sort of all the points I got on my side. So I'm, I'll be happy to open for questions. Uh, Jorge, you tell me, I don't know if yeah. you guys want to ask first. Or... Thank you, Lucia. I would be interested uh, to ask you kind of like three questions or th three things to talk about, and then maybe we can ask for the uh, 
for the, mm -hmm. the we can open the floor. The first one would be um, you were telling us that uh, depending on semester term, uh, it depends how it works. But also you told us that uh, the best thing is not to have an email, uh, not to have an email asking you for a meeting directly. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us what it would be the uh, ideal pipeline that would make your life easier from what i've heard it would be the first email explaining who i am and what do i do you answer then asking for a meeting uh, what, what would be the the, mm -hmm. the sales process if we are very very so i think if i were to to think about the ideal process um the first email would explain to me who you are what you do and what kind of activity you're offering. So all this uh, stuff I told you in terms of how many workshops or what kind of shapes this thing can take and to which students you would like to give this and to how many. Um, and maybe you can give me a timeline, but sort of like realistic in plan, in, in like it's not next month, it's not in the next two months, you know, maybe you write to me in say, March about next academic year yeah and you tell me would it be possible to collaborate next academic year and so I can sort of play a little bit with that I think from there I would reply to you I might have a particular question and sometimes if I have a particular question that means I already have an idea of where this thing you're offering can fit so it's usually good news um, and then from there we would move into a meeting yeah so I might be the one that offers the meeting in the second email. I might just, you know, ask you a couple of the questions before we agree to, to sort of have a meeting about it. But I think the most important thing is that like to send an email open enough in terms of timing and shape, but at the same time, giving me an idea of what is in your thinking. Yeah, that is not so vague that I have no idea what you're asking or that I have to do the work to shape this into something that makes sense, yeah? Yeah, it makes makes very good sense, thank you very much. And I would like to go a tiny bit more into that email because for us, the ones offering, normally that's the, that's the hardest point. It feels like uh, you're gonna make it or break it. Uh, so I would like to ask you two questions. If the second one puts you in, in the spot too much, you let me know. But the first one would be, in those emails that you've been revising, what are the things that pick your attention that is like, oh, actually I'm interested in knowing more, I'm interested in having a meeting. Mm -hmm. And the second question would be, if you receive an email about towards Juventia that you are kind of like familiar, what would be the things that pick your attention and is like, okay, I'm interested in knowing more or um, mm -hmm. having a meeting about it? I think um, I think anything that that is clear, it's and it's not something that is very um familiar like in the sense that if you're offering me a release class you know <laughs> i might not be so interested in that but if you offer me something that that sat, has some sort of spice to it you know like something as i said something we don't have and we cannot possibly have because of you know it being special or um I don't know, maybe it's, it's nothing, nothing special, but it has a twist to it. You know, you're offering something, anything that has to do with reach is research as well. Like, remember we're a research institution. Yeah, we're not a conservatory. So that's another thing. Like, what is the focus of the institution you're working for or you're wanting to work for? Um, I think that's, that's things that pique my attention have to do with that or, um, you know, like if you've trained in a, in a school that I'm familiar with and I know is a good school, which, you know, there's a lot of them. So I would be interested in, in hearing a little bit more about you. Um, if you have some form of connection with us, you know, or someone that worked for us or the usual, I've heard about the University of Malta because that would have helped as well because I then have a link to you. So it's not that it, it sort of feeds my ego, promise. It's more that if you have a link to me, I have a link to you. You know what I mean? So if you tell me I heard about you because of Jorge, then I can go to Jorge and say, hey, how is this person? And, you know, is this? And that's always good, you know. Again, it doesn't follow that if you don't know us from before, that's a straight no. Huh? It's just things that might help. Or maybe you heard about an event we organized, you know. And, and so the, it tells me a little bit about who you are as well. Um, I think that was your first question. I'm, I'm not sure I answered 
but those are points that uh, sort yeah of... pretty much the second question was, sorry, about towards Vivendi, right? Yeah, because you are kind of like familiar with what you do. Mm. We, we've collaborated. You've seen me giving the workshop to your students. What would be the things that pick your attention? What was the thing that picked your attention in the first place? Or if you wouldn't have invited mm. me to mm. do towards Vivendi and your university, what would be the things that you say, oh, this is interesting to bring it mm. to my university? I think the, I mean, enthusiasm and i think you have enough for a uh, hundred people of that jorge so just make sure that whenever you write about something that you're really passionate about you let that passion come through yeah generally speaking if you're um excited about something and you write in that way you're probably going to get me excited as well yeah and again i don't mean that you sell it to me like the best thing that happened in, in ever in the world i just mean be passionate when you're writing about it don't write a sort of dry sort of descriptive email yeah maybe you could tell us a little bit not not gigantic but a little bit of what towards Vivendi did for you and that's why you want to you know become a trainer and you want to share it with the rest of of the world yeah I think in terms of what what caught my attention I mean you know I, our research anyway relate to each other and they're very sort of funnily complementary um, but I think it, there is one particular focus that that was very interesting and I, I'm, I'm hoping I can tell this story and it doesn't sound weird but we actually we got a donation and we used that donation to pay for this particular course because the the person the donor was super excited about it and at the beginning she had told us that she wanted to to do choreography she wanted to uh, have the students have choreographic experiences through the money she was given us and when I told her about towards Vivendi, I told her, listen, this is something that works. Yeah, I mean, it, it works towards choreographic experience as well. And it works towards performance in, in several ways, but it works more importantly about this idea of presence and how the, the students work towards being on stage, but also being on life in general. So this, there's something so tangible about what towards Vivendi can bring to a training, to, to someone training. And, uh, and I think that's what you have to say, no? Like it's not, you don't train this in technique class. You don't train this in, in like the theoretical classes we do. You don't train this in a choreographic process, generally speaking. You don't train this in, I don't know, even if, if you're asked to do your own project, you don't really train this in any of these particular parts but you need it in all of them so it's something that is very specific but sort of reaches out to many aspects of a of a performance life you know and I think that's what you have to say a little bit like this is you know what you're offering literally what you're offering right now is something that nobody else is going to offer for sure I, I mean bit like you guys are going to offer it yeah but it's, it's not something very common and something very important. So I think appeal to that, yeah, to what, that, the fact that what you're doing is something that is very basic to all um, performers, but not something that we get. It's a little bit like, I, I think, like if someone were to offer me a workshop on study skills, I would be super happy and never, I never get an email like that. I always get an email of, uh, you know, I want to offer your students all this information and, but, something about processing information something about processing training something about you know it's it's like the skills that we don't get anywhere else so i think that's what we that's what i would like to hear i think or what i would i don't know what would ca ca catch my attention from from someone offering this it, it is weird for me because i've been hearing about it for so long now that i, I do had to stop and think about that one but but it was uh, very, very helpful even for me to hear from another perspective in, in such a clear, direct way it was uh, really helpful just for me. So thank you so much. And uh, sorry to put you in the spot. I have a lot of more questions. You know, like you and I, we can always talk for 10,000 millions of hours, but I think it's a yeah. good time to open the floor <laughs> for the future to residential trainers. Uh, and if they don't have questions, don't worry, I have uh, more of the things to talk <laughs> with Lucia. So uh, any, anyone who wants to jump in? Who would like to jump in? Vivian. 
Hello, Lucia and Vivian. And I wanted to ask how to find the right person to talk to in a university and how to access their email. Because all the people I've been uh, collaborating with, usually I knew from the word of mouth or from someone I knew, or it happened to go there for something else and I spoke to the right person. So if I don't know the institution or the school, how do we find the right person to speak to them? Yeah, that's actually a very important question. Thank you, Vivian. So you have, I mean, the, the sort of first point would be always to get into the websites. Um, websites for institutions usually have a staff area. That said, this can get very confusing because like, for example, we try to make it very clear what our organization is, the structures that we follow, the management structures, but it still can get a little bit confusing. So you have several options. You can try and find, um, I mean, it's always easier if you're talking about, for example, I'm talking here about us. You want to get in touch with the dance department, you find the head of department. That's the, the easy. and in our website, I'm hoping it's quite easy to find. I'm not sure. Um, if you want to speak, for example, with the School of Performing Arts, you wouldn't write to me, you would find the director of the school. Yeah. But of course, that's the other problem that sometimes we're called heads, sometimes we're called directors, someone's, sometimes is the dean, sometimes is, the, you know, so it, it does drive you a bit crazy. So the solution to that, if it gets very confusing, is find an admin person. So find a secretary, find uh, a general info at address, yeah? <clears throat> and actually don't, don't send your full email to this person, simply send an email saying, I would like to offer, you know, a, a, a service to your department. I'm interested in talking to, you know, or who would be appropriate in terms of receiving this email. Um, the other option is, is give a call again to the, to the sort of, uh, general reception of either the university or the particular department yeah and they would be able to like just say if if i wanted to send that email offering services to the dance department who would i write to and usually people are very sort of clear on on you know answering these things it's better to do that to ask either by email or or calling than to send the email to the wrong person that always gets a bit uh, yeah muddy so yes it's always good to to ask Thank you. Question. I was wondering, uh, I'm Gabby from Chile. Um, it's like super practical, but it's like the taboo kind of topic among artists and it's like prices, like money. How do you talk about money? When uh, do you put the price? Do you expect us to give you a price? Do you expect them not to talk about it and you go first? Like, yeah. Yes, you're right. Actually, I, I didn't even mention this because I'll tell you why. It's sometimes there is no question about it. I have a fee that I can give you and that's it. There is no discussion. Sometimes, depending on what you're offering, there is a little bit of leeway. So what I would recommend is don't mention it in the first email. I would probably already let you know what's happening in the second email. Like if in my answer to you, I already would tell you, you know, maybe yes, we could be interested, but just to let you know, the, the sort of economic conditions of this would be that. And I try to make it very clear from the beginning um, what the conditions are, because I know this is a, a very important question, obviously. Um, if I think, if I don't feel constrained by this, um, it's, it's basically depending on what you're offering. Yeah? If you're offering something that fits within a normal classes, that would have a specific fee, which is what we pay all our lecturers. There is no question. Yeah? But if you're offering something that might come out uh, outside of this, um, then I might ask you to give me a price. And now I know that that would be very difficult because then what do you ask for, right? Um, ask for whatever you need to ask for. Ask for what you think it's worth it yeah for what you would like to get and i will be very able to tell you listen there is no way we can pay this um could you you know could we negotiate i understand this is not ideal but you know we have a limit and then maybe i'll tell you this is how much we can pay and then it, it comes up to you to decide whether it's, it's worth your time or not this is what would happen in our institution i think it might be possible that in other institutions it's not the same so you could also prepare um, a sort of like general price for what you're doing and 
send it, but send it with a note that says, you know, budgets are negotiable. I wouldn't, I wouldn't send an email straight away saying, this is my price, take it or leave it, you know, kind of uh, attitude. Because again, like with many other things, most of the time it's just not up to us. We have a budget and you'll be surprised at how low our budgets are at universities. Um, so it's just that we don't have, sometimes we just don't have the possibility. And I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm complaining, like, uh, like we're all these poor, uh, angelic people it's not true i know we are privileged but we do have a budget yeah, and that's the limit that we have um for all these things thank i'm you. not sure that helps because it's a bit vague yeah. as an answer yeah okay thanks thank you could i please um add on gabby's question a question if it is someone that travels from a different country let's say someone that comes from the uk or from germany to you uh, do you usually, does usually the university cover travel and accommodation? Is that something that people should expect or not? It depends a bit. Like right now, we work more with a flat fee. We just try to make the flat fee reasonable so yeah, you can cover all this and um, still get some reasonable money for you. Um, what we do try to do, but that is probably because we're a smallish department, is we try to host people in our houses. Yeah, so we would usually offer you like, ah, you can stay with me or you can stay with this other person or I have a friend that has a house and you can stay there. So we try to facilitate this as much as possible. Of course, this is once we know who you are and we're like, you know, okay with you staying with someone uh, at home, but that's something we try to do. Um, I think generally speaking, we, I think, write to people, how do I put this? Write to human, write to a human and understand that whoever is receiving your email is a human and will try to help, generally speaking. Um, if you feel like you prefer to be reimbursed for a flight instead of flat fee, ask, and we will be able to tell you, for example, we don't do it because the university have very strict sort of bureaucratic um, lines towards getting someone paid and getting reimbursed sometimes is more difficult than getting paid a flat fee, for example. Um, so that's the reason why we sometimes don't do it. So we try to include it in the fee. But I think overall, like you just, this is a business, it's a negotiation, yeah? So if you're not happy with the fee, say it. Don't just take something because it comes from an officially signed email, yeah? It's, it's your work and it shouldn't be uh, sold to the point that you get nothing out of it yeah um but yeah like talk talk to us like I've, I've had this many times and and sometimes I can't help and I try you know find money from another place and sometimes I cannot help and I just tell the person I'm sorry this is all I can offer I'll understand if you cannot do it yeah generally speaking we come to an agreement I've never had a case in which we didn't come to an agreement in terms of a, of a fee so there's always a little bit of play in either side um, my recommendation is don't take anything for granted though ask if you're offered a fee just ask does this include accommodation and flight or you know do I get any sort of expenses covered apart for this and it's not just accommodation on flight do you get a per diem as well like I can already tell you we don't do per diems we can't there is no way but this is something you need to know you cannot land in, in Malta and then realize that we're not giving you per diems yeah so don't ever be afraid to ask these things it's only fair yeah that you get all this information properly and on that point always sign an agreement before you go anywhere okay universities and I know I'm talking from within <laughs> Um, maybe we shouldn't share this actually, but we're very good at doing things without official agreements. Now we've stopped completely. Like now, really, we do everything with agreements properly signed before, but always, always see the contract or the agreement before you completely agree to come. Okay, it's it's important as well. I think I think it's very important that thing of the agreement, mainly not to keep each other accountable, which was, uh, we are all nice people and things like that, but everyone to be in the same page, just to see what you said is included, it's not included, what am I expected to do, what I'm not expected to do. So just uh, the agreement for me as an artist is mainly like what is expected and we both are in the same line. Therefore, there is no problem later on that as an artist is like, oh, you're choreographing, but you were also expected to teach class in the morning. I'm like, ah, oh, but I so just the agreement is, is for me is mainly that yeah this is and, and definitely like 
it would clarify a lot of things also important things in in the in the line of work we are like copyright for example who holds the copyright for what you do with our students once you come here once you leave actually so once you leave can we use what you've brought with you and i think these are things that you want to clarify yeah before you get here um so ask for an agreement yeah Something that I'm thinking uh, for you guys at the moment, uh, over the years, I've been compiling a checklist for my contracts. Uh, therefore, I have a document in which uh, every time that I receive a contract, is this in this contract, is this in the contract? So therefore, nothing is missing. So I'm more than happy to pass you this checklist because it's been compiled over the years and it's quite comprehensive. Until the moment that one of the checklists is like, is the bathroom included in the private room or not? <laughs> So that, that comprehensive is the checklist because I encountered places that I had to go and be in a commission choreographer, which I had to share the bathroom with another five rooms in the hotel. And that is not okay. <laughs> so that is in the contract now. That's good. Very important. <laughs> a fee that was not suitable. What is a good way or how would you go about trying to, do you want to do it in a good way? Yes, I think, so you mean like you, you write to me and I give you back a, a fee that is not okay for you, right? Um, I think I would sort of appeal to reason as much as possible. So explain to me why this is not acceptable. Chances are, I will understand, you know, if you tell me, listen, just go into Malta, it's going to cost me, say, 300 euros, and you're offering me 400 euros. So, you know, it's really not a very good fee or something along those lines. Um, I, I, again, I think generally speaking, we would understand your argument. Sometimes it's just a matter of not being able to, to do anything else, you know, like literally we just can't do it because we don't have the money. But don't be afraid to be honest about the issue you know like or or simply to say i'm really sorry but right now i just cannot accept a fee like this because of you know current circumstances and you don't need to explain anything else you just tell me you know it's not possible for me right now to accept a fee like this and, and this is fine but i think just explain yeah why the fee is just not okay and um i think just i, I don't mean to say gentle in like a sort of bowing down way but be diplomatic about it like don't don't try not to get angry about it or anxious you know just try and make it calmly saying you know thank you very much for your offer um of course you know uh, this amount of money means that i would only get say 50 euros for three days of work in reality and of course that is just not manageable for me right now so if there is any way to improve the fee, I would be very grateful. If not, we might just need to talk about working together in another occasion, you know, nothing super um, angry or just just uh, explain. I think that's the, the answer. Thank you. That's okay. Hi, Lucia. Oh, no, sorry, after you. You can see that all of them lived in the UK at some point. <laughs> <laughs> the politeness was, uh, it was quite amazing, wasn't it? Uh, um, <laughs> thank you, Claire. Hi, Lucia. Thank you so much. This is really, really valuable information. Um, I wanted to ask, because I'm in a slightly unique position where I have only trained with uh, private companies, so I don't have a, an official degree from any uh, governing body of education. So, I yeah, I did just want to ask if, as a university or as an institution, are there any, uh, well, I suppose, degrees or um, formal training qualifications that you would definitely look for and say, I'm sorry, but if you don't have this, then no dice. Um, it depends a little bit what, we, what you're asking for. Like if you're asking me for a job, definitely you need to have a degree to teach here regularly. I mean, like if you're looking for a permanent position, if you're, if you're asking for a series of workshops, there is no reason. Like if, if you have enough expertise and you, know, you are trained and you have experience in what you're offering to us, 
I mean, I, I can't say this for everyone, but for me, it just it doesn't matter if you don't have a degree from a, from a university, you know. Um, it's, it's just when, if we're going to open an official position with the university, that yes, you do need an official uh, degree because universities just generally need that in order to hire people. But not for a one-off or for a series of workshops or something like that. I don't think, as long as you have the expertise that you're offering for real. And I have a way to see it, you know, like if you say you worked with companies and I can see that, then it's, it's really not a, it's not a breaking sort of point for me. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, I wanted to ask, uh, so when someone has stopped replying uh, or they're just taking too much time, is there any good way to re-engage in the conversation and to ask for a bit more uh, speed in the answer? Um, you could, it depends a little bit which position we are. So if we've already exchanged uh, several emails and I suddenly stop replying to you, you could just send an email saying, you know, I wonder if there was any progress on, on this discussion or is there anything, is there any more information you need in order to, um, you know, just, <laughs> this is gonna sound horrible, but you know, I'm trying to be as honest with you as possible. Don't make me feel bad about not answering to you, okay? Cause that's not gonna help your case. Don't tell me, oh, you haven't answered for, I know you wouldn't invite it like this, but if you, if you say, okay, I haven't heard from you in two weeks, it's going to feel a bit, you know, like icky. So always try to to offer. Like, is there anything I can help with? Can I give you more information? Um, I wonder if there's any progress on this discussion. Yeah, these kind of like soft entry points to to re uh, ignite the conversation. If I have not replied to you um, at all, you could send an email just saying. Um, you know, I, I, I wonder if you got this email and, uh, you know, I, I understand if, if this is not the moment or you're not interested, but I just didn't want it to have been missed in, I don't know, or have gone to your spam or use a little bit of an excuse to say, I just want to make sure you read the email <laughs> yeah, and you're, you're not just ignoring me. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I, yeah, I just think the point is like, don't don't tell me I'm taking too long. That's not going to help your case. Because if I'm taking too long, chances are it's because I have a hundred million other things that I'm doing and it's really nothing personal, yeah. Um, and also go for the, is there anything I can do to help instead of, is there anything that can help make this faster? Yeah, is because again, you're putting the pressure on me and that's not very... Um, helpful. Am I sounding like a princess? I am sounding a bit like a princess. No, <laughs> it's very, very useful because uh, from from this side of the of the wall, uh, as freelancers uh, trying to look for a job, um, it's very difficult for us to empathize uh, to the other side. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we forget that uh, you receive 10,000 millions of emails, that you have 10,000 millions of uh, meetings, that you are uh, an artist who is also overstretched in many different reasons. Um, mm -hmm. But because it's our priority to try to make um, a sale or to try to, to get a job or to try to because we are passionate about what we do. We really want to do a workshop in your uh, institution. We sometimes we forget that we are dealing with a human that is also overstretched, regardless that you have a fixed salary and we don't, regardless that um, your conditions might be easier or not, but the overstretch and the overwhelming is the same for you and for us. And sometimes we forget. So that's very useful to, to know. Just to give you a, an example, um, I think it was last Monday, I got in one hour 50 emails and each one of these required a lengthy personal thought through reply. So in one hour, I received enough work for five days, probably. So you get an idea of, of why I'm telling you this, you know, and if in those 50 emails, there is one email from someone that is offering me a workshop, that's just going to go to the bottom of the list for now. And, and this is nothing personal. It's nothing to do with how much, uh, you know, how interesting your workshop is, is just to do with survival. Yeah, like if I have to answer 49 emails, that will mean whether or not we have a course next year, those are going to go a bit before 
yours. So that's that's the only um, thing. And I think it's very important as well. That remember that as as Fork is saying, most of the time the person receiving your email will know exactly what you are going through. Because guess what? We were also freelancers before <laughs> coming to these positions, generally speaking. So we know what it is. It's not that we don't empathize with you. It's simply that we have constraints because of time and because of what a human being can do in 24 hours and what the institution allows you to do. Yeah, so yeah, I think this is important to remember that it's a conversation between humans and not, uh, yeah. Uh, and if I if I may add, that's something that it took me a really long time to to learn. I always uh, been a freelancer, so I always thought about two sides. You know, it's it's almost like the enemy, the producer, the the person who holds that power. And then it took me a lot of years, and things work much better for me and for the world of dance when we realize that we are in the same boat, trying to move dance forward in different ways. And that what Lucia just said is about it's a conversation between two humans with a similar objective at the end, because we are all passionate dance artists. What we want is better students in the future, better dance artists in the future, more um, aware of their environment, of what they do. Appealing to that is we are fighting for this together. It's not I'm fighting you for you give me a job that I really need to pay my bills, which is a very different approach, isn't it? And I think that's the, the reality of it is that sometimes maybe some of us have forgotten that we are this, sort of we're also you, you know, just a few years later. And we've made the decision to work for dance in this way, which as Jorge is saying, doesn't go against working for dance in other ways. But it is true that being for a while within an institution might make you forget this. So something else that you might, want to remember is that when you're writing an email like this you're trying to appeal to that sort of memory of being in this other context that doesn't sort of uh, kill your passion for what you're doing and uh, yeah that's I think that's what I meant when I said be passionate about what you're saying because if you are then I will be as well yeah because I will remember and um it will be easier to, to sort of see where you're coming from in that way. But again, as I said, we've been there. Most people, I don't think I know anyone that wasn't a freelancer before becoming an academic or a, or a lecturer or, a, yeah. Or that even sort of maintains both positions in a way at the same time, yeah. Like doing commissions and, and choreographies and stuff and being an academic at the same time. Thank you so much. We're really, uh... Como te dices en inglés? Exprimirte. We are really squeezing you. Squeezing. Uh, Leticia had a question, I think. Uh, yes, hi. Go for it, Leticia. Uh, yes, uh, I want to think it's, it's about Claire's uh, answer, uh, question. Uh, how long is the reason about time to wait for the answer from the university? How is the time for be impatient for, for some response? <laughs> Um, I would say never re send a reminder before two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Never before two weeks. And if it is a particularly busy time, so if it is June or February in a university that works by semester, then maybe give it three weeks before sending a, a, a reminder. And if we are in a pandemic, yeah, maybe give it three weeks straight away. <laughs> <laughs> Just to... <laughs> Okay. You know, to be safe but uh, yeah too i would say don't don't send something before two weeks because that, mm -hmm. that would feel a little bit too close yeah thank you i have a question um i mean first of all just thank you this is this is a treasure trove of, of jewels and gems that we can use um just because obviously over the last year there's been a, a massive shift to online training which we've had to because of the circumstances. Um, one of the big uh, characteristics about Towards Eventia is that we have a strong online training component. Um, so I'm just curious, um, speaking from your university's perspective, and maybe if you also have an idea of the sector as a whole, how much are universities planning on sticking with online training and how much are they saying we don't want this our students can't have it anymore and the minute that we're back in the studio we're in the studio full-time 
<laughs> there you go. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself for some reason. Um, that is a really good question and a really important one. And I think I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to guess here. Okay, so I think there's going to be a period where people are going to really reject online training, and it might just be a few months. It, it, it doesn't. I don't think it's going to be super long. But say, if we are back to um, being able to be in face to face in October, there will be maybe the first semester of next year that we will be a bit like, no, everything has to be face to face. And I tell you what, it's not because of me. Like I am very open to online training, but our students are so frustrated that we really need to give them time to sort of calm down and, and work through all this frustration. And um, I mean, I don't know if you guys have any contact with, with students going through this at the moment, being in full-time training and having to be online and not so much in the studio, but the, the despair hits point when they're like, I don't care if I get COVID, I just want to be in a studio. And you're like, mm, that, we can't do that. So we have to have a bit of time to work through this with them. But I think once those couple of months are, are over, people will realize and remember the benefits of, of online training. Like for us, it's been amazing this, this uh, I, I know it's weird to say it's been amazing this last year in which we've had a pandemic, but in a way we've been able to reach out to people that we wouldn't be able to reach out in normal circumstances because of the expense, you know, like literally the expense of bringing people to Malta, it's, quite a bit and in, in, imagine if I'm trying to bring someone from outside of Europe you know like that that is just money we don't have but this year we've been able to engage with people outside of Europe because we had the opportunity to do it online so I think there will be a period of rejection and I think personally I will have to deal with the frustrations in to be honest not only of students but some lecturers are very frustrated because they just don't like teaching online so we will have to deal with that and give them a bit of time to recover but then after that I think we'll start remembering that this is actually a really cool thing that we can do and it's actually a really useful thing and then bit by bit you know we will start um of you know of being open to these possibilities. So something that I would suggest is um, perhaps if you're offering online, don't offer online intensive, offer short uh, sessions, maybe once a week, for example, because that would be easier to digest than telling our students next week you're fully online with someone from that is not here in Malta, yeah? So I would say if you are going to offer that, once we are back to the possibility of face-to-face, -face, maybe offer every Friday, three hours. I don't, to be honest, I don't know what you're gonna offer, but I'm just saying ideas. Yeah, like every Friday, three hours, uh, the students are with you online in their houses. Yeah, I don't know if that helps. It is very helpful. And if I'm correct, uh, at least from my experience with uh, CITES, with Rumber, with LCDS, and what I've heard from Malta, there are already plans from those institutions to start creating programs, creating programs that are mixed mode, right? And fully online. And fully online. Because we've, we have realized the possibilities of this. And it's not only that we can engage lecturers and, and teachers from everywhere else. It's also that we can start engaging students from all over the world if we keep it online. So we are, fingers crossed, if all the bureaucracy goes through, <laughs> launching an online master's from next year. Yeah, so it will be fully online and open to everyone that wants to do it across the world. So yes, that's what I said, that there will be a period of, of rejection, but definitely the, this is something we are going to use for sure. Mm -hmm. muted. Uh, Lucia, thank you so much. Uh, I am aware of the time as well. Uh, this has been invaluable. Sorry, there one was more one more question, I believe. I was going to say that we have time for one more question oh. because I don't want to take much sorry. of your time. Uh, <laughs> right, sorry. But then because uh, we are um, in contact with Lucia, we can always uh, talk among us and passing from uh, questions uh, in the future. But we have one more question by Shannon. Hope my internet holds can you hear me yes thank you first of all um my question is about if you have several things that you can or would like to offer um, and you think they're all possible 
appropriate for the university? Is it better to start with a big offering of saying like, I can choreograph and teach towards Valencia or to start with the thing you think is the most unique and appropriate and say like, these are also some other things I'm interested in. I think it depends a bit on how far, like if I'm traveling, they need to fly me across you know, to the US from here or something, maybe it's better to offer big, but in general, do you have any thoughts on how to start that? Uh this this is quite a tricky one because if you offer too much um then i will just find it a bit vague so i would recommend to focus on one thing and and the thing that you are sort of more passionate about in this particular moment to offer that in more detail and then maybe at a, at a point in the email just say um you know, by the way, I'm also a choreographer and a technical teacher, and I would be happy also to consider a combination of all these sort of offerings. And But I think if you just tell me, and, and again, I'm not making this up. Sometimes I get these emails like, I'm a choreographer, teacher, and uh, I don't know, like uh, acrobat, and I am happy to just do anything with the university that's not very helpful for me yeah so i would say concentrate in one of the things and generally speaking in the thing that makes you most salient so whatever makes you more i especially is a bad word but if you understand like whatever is going to distinguish you from all the other emails that i get so if you're telling me you're a choreographer i i get quite a lot of um offers from choreographers so definitely towards Viventi, I would make you more um, individual in that sense. So start with that and then tell me, you know, I can also choreograph and, and as a, not as an afterthought, but sort of as a, just a, a, a completion of what you're offering, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, Lucia, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is uh, way more than I was. I don't know what I was expecting from this call, but this is a lot of information. I really thank you. And I'm really uh, grateful for that honesty, that transparency, that as a matter of fact, this is what it is. And, and we have your perspective, a point of view that is very easy. Uh, we know that is not a universal truth, but it's easy, uh, easily uh, transferable to other institutions or other, other people because it comes at the end of it to, to the human level of who is receiving our information and how we can work together. Um, Lucia, thank you very much. We will talk with the group. Maybe we can have you in another time for another more questions, but I'm really, really grateful for your input and I'm sure it's going to be very valuable for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure.